Welcome to Radio Astronomy for Programmers. I'm Mars Botfield Addison, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Tasmania, working on space situational awareness, on tracking junk in space with machine learning. Today I'll be speaking to you about the basics of six different components of radio astronomy, starting with the hardware, the objects that you might use to track with it in space, uh, the organizations involved, some of the basic mechanics that you'll need to know to be able to use the formats to do some fun stuff at the end. Starting with hardware. So we have to go a bit back in time to start this story, because once upon a time, we only had optical astronomy. And that was the obvious kind, because you could look outside in the sky and you could see the moon, or given a few pieces of bent glass and mirrors, you could see other planets. But how did radios come into it? So we had theorized for a long time that there were sources of radiation in space. In fact, in the 1800s, they already did experiments trying to locate radiation from the sun, but were limited in the instrumentation that they had at the time and couldn't find it. But if we fast forward to the 1930s, there was a young gentleman called J Carl Jansky who was working for Bell Laboratories. Bell Laboratories' business was phone lines, and they noticed that people making phone calls across the Atlantic would experience static or background noise at certain times of day. So they put their top engineers to work trying to find the source of this noise to make a better product experience for their customers. Uh, and Jansky went out into a field and built these big receivers on wheels that they called Jansky's merry-go-round. It could spin on its old four wheels. Um, and sent him to work to find out where this noise was coming from. And he thought, maybe it's electrical storms. There are lots of electrical storms over the ocean. Maybe that's what's causing this communications interference. So he went around this field, wailing around his merry-go-round and picking up signals for the better part of a year. Uh, and we found that there was a constant background noise. Static is the no name that they give to interference that they can't associate with a source that they know of. And he found that the way this signal varied didn't match the rotation time of the Earth versus the Sun, but actually the absolute rotation time of the Earth, which is something I'll touch on later. Uh, the amount of time it takes to rotate the Earth back to the same point is called a sidereal day, and it's slightly shorter than we would regard as a day, which is to get back to facing the same point at the Sun. It takes a little bit further because while we've rotated, we've also moved. So because he could see that it fluctuated on a sidereal day basis, not on a normal daily basis, then he could conclude that this source of interference must come further away than the sun. It must come out of outer space. But it was around the Great Depression, and it was not related to his phone call work, so nobody wanted it. Wrote several papers, and they just kind of went into the academic void for a bit. So if we look at these radio signals that he was picking up, what would make people think that the fact that you can pick up interference means that you could see things. Uh, so I just want to touch on the fact that radio waves are just another part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And most people are pretty familiar with how our eyes work, that light bounces off something and we pick up the reflections that tell us its location and its color. Uh, and also that we have this bifocal, that our, our depth perception only comes from the fact that we have two points to extrapolate between. So we can't see the vast majority of the electromagnetic spectrum. But they work in very similar ways. They're just differently charged photons. That means that they have different wavelengths where the length of the wave curve defines the frequency or how often it will hit a source per second. So all the way down one end, uh, well smaller waves uh, than visible light, we have X-rays and gamma rays. Uh, and up the other end, we have microwaves and radio waves. And that's where all the TV and radio signals that we think of live but they operate in basically the same way with that reflection and catch and where frequency changes can tell us something about the thing it hit on the other end, much like our eyes. Uh, so the amount of energy a photon has dictates its wavelength, dictates its frequency. And because they work in that similar way, we can stack them all together. So this is an image that combines the visible wavelengths with millimeter wavelengths and infrared. And you might see that if you looked to the sky to see an image like this, you would only see about a third of that information because those are the wavelengths that fit in your eyes and that we are made to be able to see. But all this other information is there. Uh, and a particular point about that is based on the properties of a wave, it has better or worse ability to go through things. So much like we use x-rays to see inside our body, uh, other waves can go straight through dust and particles in space that would prevent visible light from coming through. So when we look into deep space, we can see far fewer things, because there's a much higher chance of there being junk in the way. Uh, but some of these other wavelengths don't suffer that at all. And to really concrete how lucky we are to be where we are and that this works, we have to look at something called the radio window. So this is a graph from NASA that is beautifully made that demonstrates 
the wavelengths that are blocked by Earth's atmosphere. And you can see there are these little slim bits where it lets most of them through visible light. Aren't we lucky? That's exactly what we can see. Uh, and radio waves. Uh, but also here on this graph, you can see, uh, as you might have heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, that was actually one of four of NASA's great observatories that they launched about the same time. So Hubble is the one that you see beautiful pictures of from the internet, uh, because the Hubble Space Telescope looks at visible light. But on the left-hand side over here, we've got Compton, which is the great observatory that looks at gamma rays. We've also got, uh, not on this graph, Chandra, which looks at uh, X-rays, similar spectrum. Uh, and then in the middle, we've got Spitzer, the space telescope that looks at infrared. And you can use those sources together to stack images like the previous one. They give us much greater detail about the same region of space, far beyond what we could see. And they're especially strong because they're outside of the atmosphere. They can see things we can't see from the ground. But we're lucky enough that radio astronomy in that very specific divide is something we can do from the ground just fine, totally serendipitously. So we had Jansky and he discovered noise. And we know that from theory of radio that we should be able to see things in that. Uh, so there was somebody who aspired to work at Bell Laboratories with Jansky, found his work, was totally inspired, couldn't get a job there, again, the depression. <laughs> but a few years later, he decided he had nothing much going on. So he was going to build a nine meter dish in his mother's backyard to test this theory. Because he thought if this was the amount of information you could pick up by a big, big pile of dipoles that were not made to look at space, what could we see if we made instrumentation that was specially made to look at space? And he managed to show that you could see specific points. So he theorized that specific things were emitting radiation. And then he wrote about it. Uh, and that's crazy that that's how short the road to radio astronomy was. Like once upon a time, we thought there was static, couldn't really see it. We got to the 1930s and all of a sudden we think, oh, it's coming from things in the sky. And then someone goes, actually, it's coming from space. And then we're like, oh yes, let's use radios to look at space. And that was the end of it. People put them all over the place. So these are the official ones. But you can take an old TV dish and look up some guys online and make your own. Uh, so what about the kinds of things we'd want to look at with radio astronomy? So what are some objects that emit radio waves in space? Some planets do, uh, particularly like Jupiter. Some planets are made in a way that when particles enter their atmosphere or already are, they become so charged that they emit radiation, which can pick up as radio waves, but also stars. Uh, and when stars die, they become supernova and they leave supernova remnants. But sometimes when they had really massive uh, mass, so like supermassive stars, uh, they leave behind neutron stars, which are really fastly rotating uh, cores of what was left behind. And you might know these as pulsars because they pulse regularly, which when they were first discovered was seen as evidence of intelligence life. Because we thought, what would flash like a, a lighthouse out in space so regularly? Uh, but also black holes we can sometimes see because the accretion disks. So as a, a black hole sucks in mass, they've got a very specific shape that they make of the things that are entering it um, that collide around it. And so that, of course, becomes highly charged and occasionally it will flash and we can see the accretion disks through radio. Uh, galaxies themselves, because they contain a lot of these other things, and also star forming regions. So nebula, when they're becoming those star, star nurseries. Uh, one great example was the first pulsar ever seen. This is the Crab Nebula. Uh, and like we were talking about before, the, the NASA's great observatories. This is a stacked image using optical data from Hubble in red and X-ray images from Chandra in blue. The Crab Nebula includes, uh, contains the Crab Pulsar, which was the first pulsar ever observed. Uh, and as you can see, it flashes. It's kind of on like a two beep flash. Uh, we're studying the rate and the intensity at which pulsars flash tell us something about its properties and how it was made and how old it is. That's really interesting. Uh, but back to my kind of science, let's get closer to Earth. What can we track close to Earth? We actually have to go back to the start of the space race, which you may or may not know actually began in the International Geophysical Year, which was where a bunch of people came together and they decided that this year they were going to spend a bit over a year studying all the geophysical sciences. So a bunch of the Earth scientists, sciences and a, a lot of Antarctic science came out of that year. But in 1957, something really famous happened. You might have heard of Sputnik. So the USSR at the time launched the first artificial satellite into outer space in 1957, Sputnik 1. What most people don't know is that Sputnik was launched in a rocket by the same name. This is here uh, in between some of the ones that were launched after it and the test model before it. Uh, so the second stage of that rocket body also remained in orbit. It brought itself up with the satellite, broken to pieces, satellite went off, beeping around the Earth for 22 days before it fell down, but the rocket body was also up there for almost the same amount of time. Not transmitting, obviously, the first piece of space junk. 
Uh, soon after, of course, the US was very annoyed that the USSR got there first. The USSR actually got there first twice. They launched Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2, which you might know for like the space dog, before the US managed to get anything in space. They got Explorer 1, which were people holding up there, the first US artificial satellite in space. Uh, and Project Vanguard meant that soon after, Vanguard, which is now the oldest remaining object in space, was launched as well, which looked more like Sputnik, with a sphere with some, with some antenna. Uh, and using Explorer 1, we also found out about uh, Van Allen belts, where the Earth, which you might have seen those diagrams that look like this, that show that the Earth is surrounded by a certain shape of magnetic field. But that also means that we have these like highly charged particles and belts of radiation that orbit out, not orbit out, are concentric out from Earth, that affect the ways that things orbit. There's certain density, uh, solar pressures even, that mean that something doesn't necessarily orbit regularly. Uh, and the US was very panicked by the Soviet Union getting there first, and they went, we can't have those darn Soviets looking at us from the sky. So they started this thing called the US mini track system. So they knew that the USSR was close to launching something. They didn't know if they would win. So they set up these sites all over the world to look for this satellite in the sky. Receivers to receive the signals from Sputnik itself because it was transmitting. This little ball would send out a beep. Uh, and you can hear it from Earth. You can pick it up on, on radio. And so they thought, that's what we're going to do. We're going to put s satellites in space, and they're going to transmit at these frequencies. So that's what the USSR is going to do. And they spent all this money building the mini-track system. And then when they turned it on, it turns out that the USSR didn't use the same frequencies as they were planning to. Whoa. Uh, turns out that this thing doesn't even pick up the right frequencies to track this satellite, and we spent all this money. Oh, no. In comes Operation Project Moonwatch where they decided to coordinate between a bunch of amateur radio operators, amateur astronomers using optical astronomy, uh, different universities trying to piece together a network of the hardware they had available that could pick up those frequencies and could observe it visually. Uh, which means you get this really cool generation of Sputnik trackers, where they were just normal citizens who were like, hey, I can hear this beep. And they would write in, and it would go into a central log saying about where Sputnik had been seen. Even though nowadays they actually think that lots of the things that people saw it was not actually Sputnik satellite, because it was so small, it was very hard to see from the Earth. Uh, it was actually Sputnik rocket body, as we said, same name. Uh, and the Lovell Telescope at Jodrell Bank Observatory actually has this famous image, which is an echo from the rocket. So most people, when they were using their optical telescopes on the ground, didn't see the Sputnik satellite, they saw the Sputnik rocket body. This was a radio telescope that saw the rocket body, even though it wasn't transmitting. So how the heck does that work? Well, in comes radar astronomy. There are pretty core concepts to radar. It's if we know the approximate reflectivity of the material that it's made from, and we know about the Doppler effect, so we know the change in frequency based on distance and on speed of movement of a thing, then we can use that to ping it and get an idea of the distance and also its direction and speed with Doppler radar. We kind of have these two strengths where optical is really good at telling you where something is on a plane. Like I was talking about with your eyes, if you use one eye, you don't have depth, but you can tell where something is. Versus radar, where you can ping something, you get a very good idea of the surface shape of the thing on the other end, and you get a very good idea of the distance, but not necessarily the angle. So quite often we use these things together to use optical for direction and radar for distance. So they work well together. Uh, but how do we do this? Well, we already had these radio telescopes that could read in information from outer space. Like we said, we've got those stars and we've got those galaxies and they're transmitting radio waves. But we also had equipment that could transmit radio waves if we wanted to talk to things out in space, like we had some rovers and we had some probes. So to put those things together, that meant that we could see things that weren't transmitting because we would use that same hardware to transmit and then observe the reflection of its own transmitted signal. We can use that to map the surface of asteroids or of dead satellites, or of rocket bodies like Sputnik. Uh, but it has a limited range before the signal basically trails off and it won't be strong enough when it comes back. And so we can only really see things in our inner solar system. So here's a really cool image from the German Terrasar X satellite, which is in space. It is in a ground, a ground site. Uh, but it was the only image I could find that was uh, visually rendered to show an echo where something has pinged radar at something back. And so this is the International Space Station. But as you might see, it's kind of a ghostly image. And if I tell you that's the International Space Station, that's the size of a football field. It's quite a distinctive, well-known object. You could see how, if you did the same method towards something that's a CubeSat and one of many that looked very similar, that would be very hard to tell what it is. So we tried to get a little bit better 
we started using bi-static or multi-static uh, approaches to radar astronomy, where monostatic is you send and receive the signal from the same piece of hardware, and that means that the window that you've got to get up there and get back down before the thing is passed, you have to know really specifically kind of where the thing is, uh, and you might not get as strong a signal because there'd be a lot of scattering. However, uh, similar to what we do in uh, aviation control, you can get bi-static radar where you use the transmitting signal from one dish to bounce off something that will pass through its field uh, and catch the scattering on the other end, which means that the second thing can be either closer or better positioned to catch more of that echo. However, the problem also got harder. So if you haven't heard of Kessler, Don Kessler was a scientist from NASA who theorized that if we kept launching stuff into space, then we would have more things up there. And this was prior to most of the laws that exist now from like the ESA and the UN about responsible use of space, where if you're a company and you launch a satellite, you're obligated to have a plan of how you're going to get rid of it out of orbit when it's dead. When it runs out of fuel, runs out of batteries, you're supposed to orbit it outwards into a graveyard orbit or bring it down safely. People don't. <laughs> a study by the ESA estimated that up to a third don't have that happen, even if the objects are launched after these laws came into place, which before those laws came into place, we already had things like there are Russian satellites up there that have like nuclear reactor power cells in them. There's like leaked coolant from smash things. People would add modules to space stations. So before the ISS, we had Mir. And when they added something, they would get an old module and they just chuck it into space. And so there's all this junk up there. And so Don Kessler was the first person to theorize what's now called Kessler syndrome, which was that you would get this cascade reaction of things hitting things and shattering, creating more things to hit more things and shatter. And that the worst case scenario endpoint of that was that the Earth would just be covered in this fast moving belt, this debris belt that would cover us like a sphere that would make it impossible to have a space economy or explore space anymore. It would be like this shell that we couldn't get through. Uh, especially when you think about the fact that things in certain orbits are orbiting up, up to 20,000 kilometers an hour. And when you think about how much critical infrastructure we've got up there, it becomes a huge problem. So what kind of organizations do we have in this space trying to help out? There are lots, lots and lots. But since we're coming from an Australian perspective as English speakers primarily, we don't have that much infrastructure on our own. So we usually look to America. They're a big player in this space space. Uh, and they have NORAD. Yes, that NORAD, Stargate Command, but no longer NORAD. Uh, what once was the domain of NORAD, uh, in tracking satellites early in the US's space economy, uh, now has been split up against a bunch of different subordinate groups where NORAD has then become the US Space Command, uh, and then there's also the US Strategic Command, where US Space Command has the Sp Combined Space Operations Center, uh, and they deal primarily with space tracking for the purpose of critical infrastructure and live satellites. They're a great source of information for that, but then they leave tracking of debris or objects that are relevant mostly to international interests uh, to the US Strategic Command, which has the Combined Force Space Component Command. And they are the ones that are primarily looking at the overall space environment and how things different collide and interact with each other. And within that, we have the 18th Space Control Squadron, who you can follow on Twitter and are actually really interesting. These are the people that are actually doing the data transformation tasks to make these data sources work. And you can see there's just a bunch of normal people, analysts who tweet about their work, boring days at the office converting critical space information. Uh, a big part of doing this kind of analyst work as a hobbyist or as a researcher actually comes from Spacetrack, which is the public facing data source for this. You do have to log in, you have to sign up, you have to make an account. It's free, but it's just so that you can get banned if you hit their API too hard. They have really strict API limitations, which tells me they don't have that much infrastructure allocation. But what's really funny about Spacetrack is that's where you go nowadays to get TLEs or orbital ephemeris data about all sorts of things in space, or get the satellite catalog that tells you all the numbers of objects and properties of objects that have ever been launched in space and whether they've decayed, all sorts of things. But that's only online because before that, in 1985, a guy who worked either for them or in a similar company decided that we should be putting this stuff on this new thing called the World Wide Web. Uh, and so he digitized by hand all this information they were putting up about detections of different objects in space. And yes, there were less then, but that was still a lot for one person. And still, it's pretty much that one person who runs this whole website, which then uh, obviously Spacetrack space track responded by making the Spacetrack website, and then they got on themselves to digitize, the, digitize their information. But Celestrack kept on going and now just mirrors the Spacetrack information. 
they have slightly different resources available on both, but something that's really interesting about Celeste Track is it's still run by this T.S. Kelso, Dr. T.S. Kelso, who writes personal columns about how to interpret data or how different coordinate systems work. Um, all this really complex stuff, but in a really conversational way. It's really accessible, it's really fun. So I highly recommend that. Uh, but other than that, there's also a number of international bodies, like the ESA Space Situational Awareness Program. Uh, obviously, the ESA is mostly the European Union, uh, but there are also different places that reflect above a governmental level of different countries collaborating. Then you also have the national space agencies like the Russian and the French and the US and everywhere. Uh, but you also have like uh, private companies and research institutions. So lots of universities are using one or two of their own devices to have a go at these new methods, particularly for testing new perturbation models or filtering, machine learning like I am, which is pretty fun. And we also have a number of startups cropping up in this space like Leo Labs and SpaceNav and places that are selling this orbital tracking data as a service. So if you're a company and you launch a satellite, you can just buy information about where it is so you don't have to create those capabilities for yourself. But to look at the next bit, now we're going to have to get into some harder stuff. Welcome to Orbital Mechanics with Mars. I'm your host, Mars, and let's figure out how we describe different orbits. So some of the common orbits we have around Earth of satellites, artificial satellites, are examples such as geosynchronous orbit. Geosynchronous orbit orbits at the perfect altitude so that it takes a day to orbit around the Earth, exactly equal to the Earth's orbit, which means if there's a certain point on Earth that the satellite is pointing at, that will rotate with it. Cool, huh? There's also some orbits that favor certain spots. So something that's really popular with, say, Russian Space Command is the Molniya orbit, which orbits really close to Earth down south and then really far away up north, which means if you're a country that's here and you want to see your satellite as much as possible, then that's way better for you. It gets really fast around the part that you can't see. Molniya actually means lightning. Then there's a bunch of ones in between, and we need to have some common ways to describe this. So we have a coordinate system. You might know some other coordinate systems that might be like an X and a Y. And so you can describe that as an X and a Y, or even a 3D space where you have like an X, a Y, and a Z. Uh, and then you might even have four dimensions or more where they might represent like time, where you've got a movement of a thing, or maybe some more nebulous coordinate systems where they're specialized for the domain. This is like that. So orbits are typically described by what are called orbital elements. And a common one is a Kep Keplerian elements of which there are seven. Uh, these aren't necessarily the traditional ones, but these are definitely the ones that I use most, where we've got these things that describe the path of the thing, and then these elements which describe its position on that path, or speed, or movement on that path. So let's start with right ascension of the ascending node. So you've got Earth, Earth, Earth moves around the sun, and the sun moves, and the moon moves around us, and the satellites move around us, and how do you pick a spot to reference everything against? Well, when we've got the sun, and we've got the earth, and we know about how long it takes the earth to go around the sun, we've picked a spot on the earth. It's called the vernal equinox. Uh, and it's the point that faces at the sun at a per specific point in the year. So once we've got that point, which is on the Tropic of Aries or something, but let's say here, as a random point, then we can use the circumference of the Earth to pick a rotation that we're going to benchmark against. So if we have the Earth and it's upwards, so we've got the north here and the south here, and yes, everyone who's very clever is going to say, but the Earth orbits like this, but because that's to do with the Sun, it doesn't have anything to do with things that only orbit around Earth. So for this purpose, north, south. Then we have a point that we can then rotate around the Earth. So the right ascension of the ascending node is the point on the equator which this orbit crosses upwards. If it's flat across the equator, then the right ascension of the ascending node is usually zero as a default because it never crosses the equator, it just orbits around the equator. But other than that, you have the specific point that this is where the orbit goes up. And you can assume that on the opposite point is where it goes down. This is called the ascending node, where it goes down is called the descending node, and the angle between the vernal equinox and this ascending node is the right ascension of the ascending node. The inclination is again referencing the equator on the front of our globe, where we've got north and south. We've got our point where it ascends, over here. The inclination is then the angle between this orbit path and the equator, this angle here. So it's the angle between that orbit and the equator. So again, if we have these orbits that are going flat around the equator, the inclination is zero. But other than that, the inclination is if you get that disk and you offset it. <laughs> 
An important distinction here is the ones that ascend on this side is called a prograde orbit, and the ones that have an inclination of above 90 degrees, which means that they incline on this side backwards, uh, is called retrograde. And these are less common. Don't ask me why. Probably something to do with the placement of countries. Then we've got the eccentricity. The eccentricity is the extent to which an orbit is not a circle. So if we've got an orbit and it goes around like this and it's a perfect circle and it's the same distance from the Earth at all points, then the eccentricity is going to be zero. It's a circle. But then you get all the way up to approaching 1.0, which is the same as ellipses in normal maths, describes the point between the two elongated centroids. So like we were talking about with those Molniya or orbits, where they're very close down here and very high up here, this is a very high eccentricity. And generally we regard anything above 0.125 as a high eccentricity orbit. They're more difficult to track, they're more difficult to predict the paths of, and they get all over the place. The argument of perigee, then, now that we've got this orbit, we've got its inclination, we've got its ascending node, and we've got its eccentricity, is then the point on that orbit where this object becomes closest to Earth. So here with this orbit, we would assume that this is the perigee, the point where it's closer to Earth, and this is the apogee, the point where it's furthest from Earth. And it's measured as an angle from, again, that ascending node, our reference point. This tells you about the offset of the ellipse, and because of the different ways that orbits can work restrict this, it tells you pretty much everything about this space, the placement of this ellipse that we have just created around the Earth. Mean motion is just about the speed. Mean motion is counted in the average number of orbits around this path that this object does per day. So if we again talk about those geosynchronous orbits that are far enough around, they're exactly one. They stay in sync. Anything less than that is less than one. It's closer. It goes faster. Generally, anything more than 11 revolutions a day is very low Earth orbit, like the International Space Station. And anything more than one per day is so far out, we call this super sync orbit. They're very uncommon. The mean anomaly is just the amount around the orbit that you have created that this object is on at the moment. So from this perigee, our closest point, how much of a 360 degree orbit around its path has it done at the moment? So when you get this location of an object and it's got a timestamp and we say, say 90 degrees, that means on this path, it's traveled this far around from its closest point. That lets you place it on the disk that you've just created. Epoch time then is just the timestamp of the detection you've just found. So we know that if at a certain time we are here and the perigee is here and it's got that anomaly, then we know that since the previous perigee, this is how much time it took. Then using the mean motion, we know how much of that time in our time it would have been and we can tell when it was its closest to Earth and we can use that to benchmark when it will next be closest to Earth because these predictions only remain accurate for a few orbits before something will be thrown out of whack. So now we know the location in orbit, absolutely, but we do not know the location on Earth. The problem is that for each aspect of this three coordinates, we've got the longitude and the latitude and the elevation. So how far around, how far up, and how far off the surface of the Earth something is, there is something that ruins our calculation for that. For the longitude, it's the rounding of orbital time. For the latitude, it's the obliqueness of the Earth. And for the elevation, it's the irregularity of ground level. For orbital time, it is the fact, like we were saying, with Karl Jansky, that a day is not what we think it is. If this is day one, and you're standing here on the globe, and you see the sun, then when you think a day has passed, you'll be here on the globe, because you'll see the sun the same way. And that rotation from here all the way around again means that we have actually gone more than a whole 360 degrees around to account for our rotation around the sun. The difference between these two angles means that a celestial day, or until we get back to facing the same direction, a sidereal day, is actually only about 23 hours and 56 minutes or thereabouts, slightly shorter than a day. That means that if we take the timestamp of when we've detected a satellite in orbit, we actually need to convert it to this universal time, which is not something that we use day to day. It's because we have these time systems we use that add a few rounding seconds or parts of seconds on the end of every year, that approximate it so that we can do calculations of times in our head to conduct our daily lives. But actually, if you want to look at the time that space has to use, it has to correspond to the exact number of degrees that the Earth has rotated since some given point. And actually, that means you have to look to some experts to tell you 
when leap seconds are going to be introduced to adjust those times so that they get back close to each other. Every time these two time systems, the one we use and the one space uses, gets more than, say, four seconds out of whack, they introduce a leap second at the end of the year. On the 31st of December, you will get midnight 59.60. Well, 11.59.60. <laughs> you get an extra second and no one notices. That's just to bring everything back in time. So once you've figured out how you go around, how do we go up? Well, the problem is the Earth isn't round. So if you think about how you know where something is in space and you want to trace that to a point on the Earth, what you'd probably think is you just go, oh, well, the center of the Earth is here. And we're just going to draw a line between the two. Except that actually, our sphere is flat. Not this dramatically, but I'm going to draw it this way so you can see that actually the difference between this angle isn't even something that we can mathematically solve. Because the obliteness isn't even even. Uh, and again, when we talk about this in ground irregularity, we just kind of have to keep doing this iterative adjustment to try and nail down this point to within some margin of error that we're okay with, where usually we do this mathematical loop where we try to get closer and closer and closer until we're within some sort of epoch. And then we go, yeah, that's about right. That's probably where you can see that thing from. Then looking at ground level, of course, we've got some idea of sea level, and we usually count elevation as that. But actually, the ground kind of goes like this all over the place. So trying to account for that kind of angle difference, we don't even bother. So we've taught you something about the coordinate system and the uncertainty used in mechanics. We don't have time to teach you everything else. And there's still the fun bit to come, perturbations. Because even though you know exactly the orbit that an object is taking, exactly how long it takes, it's only going to take a certain amount of time before it all gets buggered up and changed. And that's because there's all these things, these interacting forces out in space, like the sun heating up molecules that then create solar resistance and pressure. You get these charged particles that stay right just outside of our atmosphere around Earth. We get those radiation fields and all these things, not to mention if it collides with another satellite, we'll knock it straight off orbit. And also lots of the satellites in orbit can move themselves and do so often to avoid collisions. So you have to update it all the time. So how can we do some of this ourselves? So now let's take a look at some of the data formats that you might have to work out in this space that show some of the information we've talked about. So the types of data that you might have representing detections of things in space kind of come in two different camps, where one is this is the location that we have detected something in, uh, its speed sometimes, uh, the different orbital elements we talked about previously. So this is, this is where something is, and this is kind of what the path it's on. And the second camp are more the visibility type, where you have seen something either in optical imagery or in radio imagery, where you then have to infer some additional information from that to say where something is in that picture. So interpretation of the second type of data can lead to the first type of data. But let's start with the first one, because that's easier. We've got this format called two line element sets, and it's in brackets, in, in bunny quotes, uh, because frequently nowadays we give them three lines where in the, the line one and line two, they're those orbital elements, which we just talked about, uh, that tell you where something is, what its path, its trajectory is, and about how it's moving. Uh, we've also got some information there about like the international designator, which is made up of the year that it was launched and what type of object it is. So you get different codes for whether something was a rocket body or a payload or is a debris object. However, we've now got that zeroth line, the third line in the two line element set, where we often include the human readable name of the thing. So in this case, my example set has Vanguard 1, the grapefruit, the oldest object still in orbit, uh, the third, fourth artificial satellite in, in orbit. Uh, and this was where it was on sometime in December. Uh, on the same vein about talking about where something is and its orbital properties at the time, we've also got ephemeris files, which you see less often. And there's also the CCSDS orbit data messages, which have different formats depending on whether you want lists of times you've detected something or more information about the one time you detected something um, and whether you want it as a position and a velocity or those orbital elements that we were talking about that are harder to compute to a specific position but give you more information overall. Uh, so they look more like this. They're more like complex header data blocks. But usually we'll just end up using these two-line element sets. And most other things can be distilled down into these two-line element sets. So these are really easy to use if the fact that they've got a three-line format makes it slightly annoying to parse and anything. But Python, total whiz. Now going to the other camp where we're looking about visibility data, things you've seen, we've got FITS. FITS is pretty standard worldwide. It's called the Flexible Image Transport System. And you can actually use it for astrophotography, normal imagery, all sorts of things. It's just this generic format that has been adopted by us to astrophysics and astrophotography and radio astronomy because it's just a data format that defines a header and then has a bunch of tables, kind of. Uh, <laughs> to go back to this, you can see this image has been rendered from a FITS file, 
but it's because the header block will tell you some information about like how many channels and about the size, but then all the tables can be a ragged n-dimensional array. It means that you can have images with an arbitrary number of channels, not just RGB. You can represent high complex spaces. You can also uh, make the different axes represent different things. So you might not just have a 3D space like you have captured a 3D radio image, but you also might have fourth dimension where it represents movement through time or whatever. It's very, very flexible, flexible as it says in the name. Uh, and it also means that you can get incredibly dense, non-compressed information. So some people do use it for images because unlike other photography formats where you'll get like eight bits, 16 bits to a pixel, you can have 32, you can have 100 bits per pixel on this. If you define it in the header, you can store as much information as you want. So it also means you can get multiple data sources and put them into the same fits file and just give a wealth of information about the different points and make those different axes represent different things again. So about whether it's spatial or temporal extension, you can put it all in this one file. So we've got the header and then we've got tables, an arbitrary number of tables, and there are different types of tables you can put in. So if you look at the, the FITS website, there is really clear documentation about the definition of the spec of the file format. There's also some places that you can go and get sample FITS files to play around with. Something I find really funny though, is down in the corner here, we've got ATNF, the Australian Radio Telescope Data Archive. So the Australian Telescope National Facility, the ATNF, is the part of CSIRO that operates parks, and the Australian Compact Array, and one other that I can never remember, uh, and they're associated with the Square Kilometre Array people. They do a lot of the stuff around Radio Astronomy Australia, uh, and they actually use this format called RP Fits, which looks very similar. We've got the header block, and then down the bottom, it's not human readable, you can't open it in a text editor, so it just turns to gobbledygook, because it can't be Unicode. Um, but it's actually not convertible to Fits. So this Australian Fits just means that you can't use any of the software that you normally would for FITS files. Even though NASA's made all these really nice things for you to interpret FITS files as images, you load them straight in. That image for a few slides ago, it's called FITS Liberator, where you just put a FITS file on it, which will render it for you, and you can pick what you want different values to pick as a palette, which is really interesting, because when you think about how most of the space images you see, say not true color, and you think, why, what color is it? It's because it's not really a color, it's outside of the color range, and we're just assigning them imaginary colors. So there never could be a true color. Uh, but that's how you pick what different points would be which colors, how you would make those beautiful things. Um, you can't do that. Instead, you get to use Myriad, which has this incredibly retro website that's been made by the ATNF and still runs on Fortran nowadays. Seems to be mostly written by one person in the 80s. So between the TLEs, which are incredibly well used and only really had that one big bugger up when they figured out that the end of each line is a checksum value, and at some point, a hobbyist figured out that the way that they'd been digitized for many, many years at that point meant that the checksum was always false and they had to change something about it. And also the fact that nowadays we're butting up against the edge of how many objects you can fit in a five character ID field. It works pretty well, but then you get to these more complex formats like FITS, which are for visibility data and the problems that you can encounter just blow way out of proportion. <laughs> uh, but they're still really fun to have a play with. So let's have a go at doing some ourselves. So our first task that you might want to have a go at is tracking a satellite from home, specifically to track when a specific satellite you might like to see is going to go over a place that you'll be able to see it from. So a common use for this is people looking at when the ISS is going to pass over, where they'd be able to see or take photos from their house. And you can do this yourself. Uh, you just get a CSV from one website, you use it to fetch CSVs for another website, and then you input it to a known mathematical model. Uh, some of these pieces are alone quite complex. So uh, those perturbation models we were talking about, they can be pretty hard, but lots of Python libraries, and there are libraries for almost every language that you like, have that inbuilt, and it's like a single function call. So it's very easy. So if you want to choose your favorite object from the SatCat, here I've chosen Vanguard 1, little grapefruit, uh, and you can see that its NORAD ID is 5. It is the fifth thing in object when you include rocket bodies and stuff. And the rest gives you information about some of its most recent detections information, feeds back into the SatCat, and also when it was launched and what type of thing it is. Sometimes if you want more information that's available in the TLEs, the SatCat will tell you things like the size of the object the TLEs won't. So I like to glue these things together. You can just look up the, the catalog objects without getting the whole SatCat, but it's nice to have a look at the kind of object that you're going to be tracking. We're going to take that catalog ID to space track. Uh, and this is a code slide. But basically what we're doing is we're hitting a particular endpoint. We're asking for all of the results of the last 25 times you've seen this object that we want to see. What are the last 25 times you saw Vanguard 1? And often these objects are seen upwards of twice a day. 
given all the networks around the world. So you'll get the last couple of days, but if you want the last month, you could get 100 detections of even a small object like Vanguard 1. Uh, then you're going to construct a, response, a request object uh, because you need to put some information in the post field of the HTTP request, and then you just get that back and you read it out as text, and then you can put it into pandas or whatever your favorite table CSV kind of data format is for manipulation. Uh, then you're going to input it to SGP4, SGP4 um, those simplified general perturbation models as before. Um, and while we did say that there were the deep space ones as well, usually in more recent software they've been rolled in together and depending on what you query that function with, it will select the right one. Or some of them just default to use SGP4 instead. It's become pretty much the de facto standard. So it does have higher margins of error, but that's still what most people use nowadays. Uh, it comes in built in lots of general astronomical libraries, especially for... Python, I've seen ones for, goodness, Rust, Swift, everything, everyone, everything that everyone likes. Pick your favorite language. Uh, Skyfield is my go-to. Uh, it's very easy because you can just say, here is the object and here is the time I want it predicted for. And then you just get the sub point, which is to predict its point in the globe. Again, with that oblateness. Um, that does give you some of that time trickiness. Not all languages and not all libraries will do that for you. This is one that does do it for you, which is why I like this particularly, because you can just give it in like UTC time and we'll do that time conversion as well as doing the location conversion for you. So that's great. Otherwise, you can go and you can read the paper that these perturbation models came from, or more recently, you can look at some of the startups that are making their own models and see if you can get access to their models. Give them a go, write your own. Become a genius about solar radiation. Uh, and then you can use that to get a lat long path or a curve path that you can then either plot onto something as a ground track, which is what we call when we draw it on the globe. Here's an example of one from a website called N2YO. Otherwise, you can just use them as a lat long. It's very easy to look up on Google where you are on the globe in lat long. Uh, then, if you want to compare different space surveillance systems, like I was saying earlier about how there are some young startups in this space that are using completely different models, and if you want to look at the difference between these two things, you can just fetch. TLE data from the Celestrack supplemental database, which is where they put TLEs that have come from less verified or alternative providers. And you can use the detections of the same objects and then just compare how much their orbital paths were changed between the different uh, reacquisitions. So if you've got one detection one day that says that it's on a certain orbital path and then the next day its inclination has changed by a whole degree or something, then they're probably not doing very well. But if the same provider has multiple consistent ones where they had a pretty good handle on the orbit in the first place, then you can assume that their models are working better for those parameters. However, it's not really a case of one is greater than the other. This gives you a really good insight into some providers are actually way better at tracking objects with certain orbital characteristics or in certain regions. Specifically, we're definitely better at tracking things in the Northern Hemisphere or that have their perigee in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and we find much higher variance in objects as they pass around the, the Southern Hemisphere in their orbit path. Uh, so this could be a fun statistics activity for you to do at home. Uh, then if we go to the interpreting telescope images, which is usually the thing that people find way more fun, you want to make those pretty calendar-looking multicolored nebula shots, uh, you're going to select your level of difficulty, then you're going to select fits, because RP fits is way too hard and you don't want to learn Myriad for fun. And then to interpret fits files, you're just going to use a program that someone has written for that. It's not as interesting as it may have made it sound, because astronomy has been around for ages and people have made some really amazing open source solutions that have been built on for decades, that have well-documented histories, that have great features, and they're usually backed by the space agencies themselves. So particularly Fitz Liberator is actually from the ESA, uh, but you can also get plugins for any of your common image manipulation software like Photoshop. Again, you can use Python libraries as the most common, so like AstroPy will do it natively, but you can also get the standalone libraries like CFITS.io, where most of these other solutions actually call CFITS.io underneath to do that interpretation of Fitz. So you can just go use that yourself, or you can dissect its source code because all these things are open source, and it's great. If you want to make your own FITS files, of course, it's a much harder proposition. Uh, if you want to do it with a camera, there are some excellent astrophotography blogs covering this topic. If you want to do it with an optical telescope, you're probably going to use a camera on the end of it. So same deal. Uh, if you want to do it with a radio telescope, then you're either going to use someone else's radio telescope, like that belongs to a university, and maybe it probably does it already. That's a pretty standard exchange format. If you've done the route of building your own DIY backyard radio telescope, that is some analog to digital file format stuff that I cannot help you with, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I do wish you great happy space, beautiful images, and deep understanding of the outer space ecosystem, and particularly of our near space garbage pile. Uh, and if you have any more questions, you can reach out to me here, and I've also left some fun code examples for you at the following URL, so you can go and poke around yourself.
But if you want to circumvent all my recommendations and just go straight to the source, here are some great links. Go check them out, and I hope you have a great time. Thank you.